You know, um, Jesse kind of has that wrong. I mean, because of course it was uh, Jesse and Steve and uh, a number of other people who uh, cornered me at OSCON, I think it was in 2007, and said, uh, we need a gathering place for our tribe. And uh, I, I was supportive, but I wanted to know more. We, we organized what we called the, the, I think it was the Web Operations Summit. And, uh, but pretty sh shortly after that, these guys just took the ball and went off and running. And so it's really their creation and uh, their desire to bring you together as a community that brought us here. And uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty awesome because this is an amazing tribe. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So you guys obviously uh, know, probably know us first as a book publisher, and you know us through our conferences like OSCON and the stuff I've done about Web 2.0. But at O'Reilly, our core mission, as we describe it to ourselves, is changing the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators. That means people like you. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, we, we, we think about uh, the, the world through the lens of this wonderful quote by William Gibson, where he says, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. I became convinced quite some time ago that there was a future coming towards us at full speed, that there was some set of people like you who were already living in the middle of, and it was going to uh, change everything. And uh, that really is the origin of, the, of this conference. We had that context so that when uh, Jesse and Steve came to us and said, uh, you know, we want to uh, bring this, this tribe together, we were fertile ground. So that was really why we brought this community together in this conference. But my fascination with operations really goes back to the very beginning of my writing and publishing career. Before I was a publisher, I was a contract technical writer. And uh, the very first book that I actually dreamed up, and I actually sold it to somebody that they should hire me to write, was actually uh, for a company called MassComp, uh, Massachusetts Computer Corporation. And it came out of the fact that um, whenever we had problems, we went to this guy named Tom Texera. And, 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 uh, and suddenly, I, I asked the, the, the management, I said, what are our customers going to do? They don't have a Tom. And, and so I basically then persuaded them that they should uh, hire me to write down everything that Tom knew. And I think it was the first uh, Unix system administration book ever written. Um, uh, and then, you know, our, our, our flagship book in the early 90s, Programming Pearl, you know, we heard on mailing lists that there was this new language that was sort of being used by sysadmins and operations people. And, uh, it, it, you know, it was, it was sort of out of the community that we heard about that. It wasn't because it was being marketed by someone. It was the fact that it was on the ground. And, and at O'Reilly, we longed to find, you know, administration and making things work as the core of what, what drove our publishing program. Um, but it's more than that. Um, in uh, 1998, uh, I was uh, trying to think about the importance of, of Pearl, because we'd launched this Pearl conference. And I had this uh, really, really eye-opening conversation with Jeff Friedel, who wrote our book, Managing Regular Expressions. And, and uh, I said, what do you do with Pearl at Yahoo? And he said, well, I spend the day writing regular expressions to match up uh, you know, people and topics with ticker symbols for you know, finance.yahoo.com. And I thought, oh my god. You know, that's why languages like Perl are so important, is because the, the program isn't written once. It's written again and again every day, because that's the way the world is changing. There are actually uh, you know, people involved in the process of making this next generation of software work. And uh, I'm going to come back to that later, but I, uh, because it became a central idea for everything I've thought about with Web 2.0, that, that this next generation of applications still have people inside them. And it's just a very, very different kind of software than the old school of, say, personal computer software artifacts. And so I started pushing our editorial terms teams pretty early on to start looking at uh, you know, what was happening inside of sites, behind the scenes. Uh, we were a little too early because at that point the feedback was, well, there's only so many big sites and so on. Uh, uh, but then there's this post that Jesse mentioned. I, I had uh, this eye-opening conversation with uh, the, the uh, VP of Ops uh, for uh, Microsoft um, uh, Windows Live 
Deborah Sharpity, and she said, you know, in the future, being a developer on someone's platform will mean being hosted on their infrastructure. And uh, this was not long after, uh, you know, Amazon had launched its web services, and it was like, whoa, you know, this is a big part of the future. And so those two ideas came together that, that uh, you know, this, this sort of people-centric, uh, or sort of people-driven applications and infrastructure-driven applications were going to become uh, the next wave of computing. But I'm going to talk a little bit today about where this is going, you know, topics like cloud computing, data-driven applications, you know, mobile, uh, and even really beyond the web. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about cloud computing, but I always like to remind people that words like that don't mean uh, what you think it means. The future is almost always inconceivable. Um, and so the idea that I have been obsessed with for the last, at least the last decade, actually probably longer than that, is that a big part of the next revolution is that applications are deeply driven, or competitive advantage is deeply driven by large amounts of data and algorithmic intelligence to, to draw meaning from that. And uh, you know, I, I sum this up in my Web 2.0 paper back in 2005. Uh, with the phrase, data is the intel inside of the next generation of computer applications. Although I actually first used the, that, uh, that, that sort of phrasing in 1997, uh, although not about data. But we really see this in the mobile world. When you look at an application like uh, maps and navigation on the phone, you can really see this idea of the internet as a data-driven operating system. You know, where you, you, know, you go, oh my gosh, I'm driving along, the phone knows where I am, I can search for things along my route. You know, in the case of, of, uh, of uh, the Android phones, you've got integrated speech recognition, you've got live traffic, you've got imagery. I mean, how cool is it you drive up to a location and it switches into you know, uh, street view mode, and you go, oh my gosh, there's an amazing, amazing operational back end. You know? And so when you're sitting there with your, your, your phone, you know, if you think that it's all about these little local games, you're missing the point because at the end of the day, there's all of the really, really powerful applications are network applications, and they have this huge uh, back end uh, that uh, you guys are all a part of. And of course, you know, we look ahead at the augmented reality future. Again, uh, you know, data everywhere uh, delivered locally. Uh, so I, I started talking about this idea of the Internet operating system back in 2002, although at the time I was focused more on software than on data. Uh, I eventually came to believe that this future Internet operating system that we're building is a data operating system. You know, it helps applications find out about people, places, things, prices, you know, documents, images, sounds, all kinds of stuff. And then it you know, helps people interact with them through services like search and payment. Uh, but it's also going to have new layers that are around different kinds of business rules. Uh, you know, when you think about, well, what does it mean, for example, what will it be to have a HIPAA-compliant cloud so that people can put applications uh, that have medical privacy in mind or uh, certain kinds of financial um, rules embedded? Uh, I had a wonderful conversation a few years back with somebody at uh, Microsoft Research where he was talking about uh, how do you deal with location privacy? You're going to have to deal with it by implementing various kinds of business rules around when and how people give up their location. So as we start to build this uh, next layer of software, there's going to be all kinds of decisions that are going to be embedded in the systems themselves. And uh, you guys are going to be right in the middle of defining what that looks like. Uh, there's another aspect, which, of course, ties into the focus of this conference on performance and speed. Uh, because all this has to happen in real time. The mobile world in particular is driving real time. You know, it matters a lot for web performance optimization, but it matters even more when you're in the mobile world. Uh, Jeff Jonas, who's one of uh, the most interesting thinkers about big data, uh, uh, starred in, a, in an ad from IBM recently. Uh, for their Smarter Planet initiative, and he posed a really interesting question. He said, would you be willing to cross the street with data that was even a minute old? And, and that is going to be one of the critical uh, frontiers, is taking this real-time, high-speed experience that you guys are working on and bringing it 
to the mobile world because they're going to be applications that absolutely require real time. They require up to the minute uh, where competitive advantage will come from milliseconds or maybe even microseconds. We already see this in the financial world, of course. Um, but there's another aspect to the future that I want to share with you and get you thinking about. And that came uh, to, to clear to me uh, from two books that we published about a year apart, but they were sort of in the same, I guess I, I see books sometimes before they're, they're done, so they were in the, sort of the same time frame for me. One was, was a book on uh, the Open Computer Vision Package, Open CV, and the other was a book we published called Programming Collective Intelligence about uh, various kinds of algorithms for uh, extracting meaning from data. And what I was really struck by was that many of the algorithms and even many of the, the software packages were libraries and so forth were actually the same. And that got me thinking a lot about sensors. And of course, sensors had also come up in the context of uh, Make Magazine, which we started publishing in 2005, and the Maker Fair, which we launched a year after. And publishing books like Arduino, which are about sensor platforms and how successful they've been. Uh, Tom Igo's fabulous book, Making Things Talk, which is coming out again. And it kind of fit into a narrative which I've been telling myself for the last uh, you know, decade or so, which is the way technology evolves is that hackers play. Uh, they do things for fun uh, because they're just passionate about uh, seeing what they can make happen. And then entrepreneurs build products for consumer early adopters, and then uh, enterprises eventually follow. You know, we've seen this story repeat again and again. And so, sure enough, you know, the software entrepreneurs are coming along uh, with sensor-based applications. You know, uh, you know, this is Red Laser for reading barcodes. Uh, of course, Google Goggles, uh, still a labs project, but actual image recognition, uh, you know, turning into a, a sort of a consumer-facing application. Uh, we're seeing the hackers working at it, uh, you know, Arduino and Patch Bay, which is a... Uh, so the back-end aggregator for sensor data. Uh, we're starting to see devices. This is the Wi-Fi scale. It's a Wi-Fi connected scale that you know, it sends your weight up every day. Uh, you can actually get it on your phone, too. Um, actually, I started losing weight because I started carrying around this little sensor device in my pocket, and, which was telling me how much I was moving every day. Um, you know, this new uh, technology coming out. This is a government project, uh, NINDirect, which is about how do we exchange medical records data, which is not just going to be lab, is not just going to be uh, doctor's uh, you know, notes and so on. It's also going to be lab data. So we're starting to see more and more sensors uh, in the mix. Uh, another interesting application, uh, this is CabSense, collective intelligence app that tells you what's the best street corner nearby to catch a cab based on historical data. Um, you know, we're seeing you know, the idea of other sensors being ho hooked up to, to cell phones. And really fascinating uh, story I heard uh, a year or two ago. Uh, Amy, which is one of the uh, portfolio companies for our venture fund, uh, has uh, data from uh, uh, millions of smart meters in the UK. And one of the things that they noticed uh, is that you can actually tell the make and model of appliance that people have by the unique energy signature just in the spike, spikes from the meter. You know, your hot point refrigerator is different from your you know, Maytag refrigerator, and you can identify them. So that kind of comes back to this idea that data is going to be coming in, meaning is going to be extracted, value is going to be there. Uh, another company I heard about recently, this is actually a public company, I'd never heard of them before, called Passer, uh, which has been collecting uh, radar traces of all U.S. domestic air, air traffic for the last uh, 10 years, and now they're doing amazing predictive analytics to improve airtime uh, air traffic performance, and uh, you know, again, somebody has been gathering data from sensors, putting it through uh, powerful algorithms, and turning it into useful applications. So, you know, when you think about the world that you're living in, don't just think about applications that are consumed by humans. Uh, think about the number of applications that are increasingly going to be consumed by other machines, where the data is going to be produced by machines, and of course. In that context, uh, you know, human performance uh, measurements, uh, you know, uh, are going to be uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Because if it's, if it's, uh, if it's, if the difference is measurable uh, by humans, it's already glacial by machine standards. So the need for speed is going to go up. Uh, the need for optimization is going to go up. Uh, the need for dealing with very, very large scale 
data, uh, powerful algorithms to deliver applications is going to go up. So I've written about chunk about this in a paper I wrote last year called Web Squared, Web 205 Years On. If you, if you haven't seen it, you might want to check it out. Um, but so when I think about the cloud, I, just, I think a lot about devices. I think about uh, the UI is on the web, not necessarily on the device, uh, because that lets you have a little you know, portable device. You know, I mean, I say this Philips Direct Life that I have in my pocket uh, you know, has no UI except the web. Um, uh, uh, you know, we're going to see robotics coming around on the guitar augmented reality, and, and a whole new generation of personal electronics that are, are web-connected. Uh, so all this stuff is going to move from hackers uh, to the mainstream, and it's going to have a real business impact. On that point of business impact, I want to point you to a blog post I did uh, a couple of years ago called Google, Walmart, and MyBarackObama.com, The Power of the Real-Time Enterprise. You know, a huge part of business advantage in the next decade is going to come from wiring enterprises end to end. You know, when I'm walking around on this stage, you know, I'm basically doing so because I have all kinds of constant feedback loops that tell me what to expect, you know, when my foot goes down. Obviously, if that black spot there was a, a hole, it wouldn't be what I expected, and I would have to react. Uh, you know, Walmart, uh, 20 seconds after you take something to the cash register, a new one is on order. Uh, you know, Google, in real time, setting the price for ads. Uh, you know, MyBarackObama.com was actually in real time during the um, election, taking people off of the, you know, the call, get out the vote lists, uh, because they, they discovered they'd already voted. And so these kinds of, of building organizational nervous systems, I think, is going to be an increasingly important part of your world. But this, this other point that we started with in, back in the beginning with Jesse's comments, uh, there's another idea that's so central uh, to Web 2.0 and the internet uh, operating system, that people are the intel inside. I mentioned that uh, with that insight that I got from talking with Jeff Friedel at Yahoo. And I exploded that in my Web 2.0 paper into the idea that the core of Web 2.0 applications is harnessing collective intelligence. And uh, you know, we see this in applications like C Click Fix or some of the other Open 311 systems, again, trying to turn citizens into public sensors. Uh, we see it amazingly in the, the, the Ushahidi platform, originally developed for monitoring election violence in Kenya, played an enormous role in uh, the Haiti crisis relief. Uh, it, uh, again, how many here know about how Ushahidi was used in Haiti? OK, I should tell that story a little bit. Jesse, Jesse does. But basically, this is a system for taking messages in from SMS or Twitter or any source, plotting them on a timeline and a map. Now, uh, but think about what was happening in the slums of Port-au-Prince. Uh, there were no maps. So of course, the OpenStreetMap guys were out there mapping uh, real time. Uh, people were sending in, uh, uh, the, the basically, the State Department helped get up some, some uh, free short codes so people could get free SMS. Uh, but the messages are coming in in Creole which nobody you know, quite understands, uh, or very few people understand. Uh, so they managed to use Crowdflower and other front ends to Amazon Turk to, to outsource all the translation uh, to uh, people in the Haitian diaspora community. All this stuff is coming back in, getting plotted. And so they're able to say, in this location, which we just mapped, uh, there are you know, three people under, the, under a building. And then, of course, they were using Skype to coordinate all the relief agencies. And, this amazing platform they put together uh, under the Crisis Commons uh, you know, uh, initiative. And really astonishing example of how all this technology can be a force for good, how uh, humans and machines together can build something uh, greater. Uh, uh, but there's also more than that. In 2003, I started giving a talk called The Open Source Paradigm Shift, and in there, uh, was a slide that was inspired by that conversation with Jeff Friedel. I actually talked about uh, the idea of von Kempenelon's Mechanical Turk, uh, which of course was this uh, chess playing automaton, supposedly, that was traveling around in the early 1800s playing against people. The secret was there was a man hidden inside. And it was that image that I used um, you know, to explain the difference between software uh, in the cloud uh, versus software artifacts in the PC era. 
And I actually gave that same talk or a version of that talk at an Amazon All Hands meeting a couple of weeks later in May of 2003. Uh, of course, uh, Jeff took the idea of Mechanical Turk and went in a very, very different, very creative direction with it. Uh, but in that talk, I remember saying to the, the, the staff at Amazon, you are all inside the Amazon application. It wasn't just the developers. It wasn't just the operations people. It was also the editors, the graphic designers, people who are making that site live every day. And that dynamic of people being inside these applications is, is just something to remember. We are really becoming part of our machines. You know, our users out there in the world are contributing. We who are making these things run are you know, in the bowels of these applications, keeping them alive, keeping them dynamic. And it, this is something uh, new and powerful. We're in a symbiosis with this global computer. And we have a lot to think about how to make that work right. So you know, when you think about uh, web operations, it's not just thinking about this. It's also thinking about this. You know? And of course, um, you know, companies like uh, Jesse's company, OpsCode, are, are, are teaching us that we can be smarter about this, that we can actually build software to help uh, automate many of the processes that we, we did manually before. Uh, and, and that's really what a lot of you guys are, are working on. But at the same time, uh, we are in this interesting transition where the role that this community plays is absolutely central uh, to the next generation of applications. It's not all about algorithms. Even when you know, um, there are algorithmically driven applications, there are people who are testing those algorithms, who are checking the results, who are having to rewrite the algorithm to make it work better. And uh, I, I think that aspect of human-computer symbiosis is something that doesn't get enough uh, attention. Um, I also wanted to highlight uh, just something that Jesse wrote in the introduction to this book, Web Operations, that we just published, which is a collection of, of war stories and advice from uh, many of the best and brightest in this industry. You know, the web is changing the way we work and live. Uh, you know, more and more people are de depending on it. And so I just want to emphasize for all you guys, web operations, web performance management is work that matters. I've been calling uh, on developers to do stuff that matters. You guys do every day uh, work uh, that people depend on. Uh, you know, clearly there are aspects. Steve uh, uh, Sotis uh, recently wrote uh, a you know, wonderful blog post about the business impact of web performance optimization. Uh, it's pretty clear that uh, you know, the real dollars in this field, which I think is part of why there are so many of you here, because people are seeing and understanding the business impact. Um, and it's so important. The reason we put together an event like this is because our mission is changing the world by sharing the knowledge of innovators. You guys are inventing this future. There's all these moving parts. We don't know how this is going to work. Uh, you know, so when we bring you here, it's for knowledge sharing. And it is a wonderful venue, and people who are competitors, uh, people who are from different industries coming together to help figure out this future, to help build what works and tell stories to each other about what you've learned. Uh, that's an incredible gift uh, to each other, but also it's a gift to the world because you're on the cutting edge of a really important future. Uh, there's another aspect I want to talk about. I, I'm, I've been somewhat concerned about the closing down of the web, that uh, companies are increasingly at each other's throat, uh, trying to figure out competitive advantage against the other guys. Uh, I wrote another post called The State of the Internet Operating System, where I'm kind of stacking this up. And I just want to urge you to work together. Because we have not figured out yet how all this stuff is supposed to work. And competition is certainly part of figuring that out. But don't forget cooperation. Don't forget open source. Don't forget open standards. Keep working together to build uh, the infrastructure that we're going to need for a future that we're just at the very beginning of. I mean, amazing is what you guys do today. It's going to be even more amazing next year, and even more important next year, and the year after, and the year after. We are moving into a world that is going to be more and more fully networked where the kinds of things that we do in the consumer internet are going to be the things that matter to the operation of society. 
And uh, Jesse, again, from an email, wrote, uh, operations is where big decisions are made and policies executed that affect people and societies. There is almost nothing to guide us. He also wrote, figuring out this stuff is hard. We'll make mistakes. That's OK. And that's, again, why it's so important for you guys to be together, to be sharing not just your successes, but your mistakes. Um, and when Jesse said there's nothing to guide us, uh, I wanted to point you to another of Steve's uh, blog posts uh, where he wrote Zen and the Art of Web Performance. And he, in there, he quoted uh, Robert Persig from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, talking about how uh, somebody had built a beautiful wall. And it was beautiful not because of any masterful intellectual planning or any scientific supervision or any added expenditures to stylize it. It was beautiful because the, way, the people who worked on it had a way of looking at things that made them do right unselfconsciously. They didn't separate themselves from the work in such a way as to do it wrong. In each case, there's a beautiful way to do it and an ugly way of doing it. And in arriving at the high quality, beautiful way of doing it, both an ability to see what looks good and an ability to understand the underlying methods to arrive at that good are needed. Now, that's a wonderful rallying cry for you guys, because there are decisions that have to be made on the spur of the moment. You know, Something's going wrong. You've got to fix it. You've got to have that innate sense of what's right to guide you. Uh, you can't go, it, you, yes, you do have to be prepared. You do have to make plans. Uh, but you also have to internalize and, uh, you know, and work from that innate sense of what's right and beautiful. Uh, wonderful message also from Mark Twain who says the same thing. Do the right thing. You will gratify some people and astonish the rest. Um, I want to, in closing, I want to uh, switch tracks a little bit uh, to one of my current passions. Uh, some of you probably know I've been working a lot with government. I've, I've started some events, the Gov2O Expo, the Gov2O Summit. Uh, I've been focused a lot on trying to teach government how to think like a platform provider. Uh, you know, what lessons we can take from your world and apply to the way government itself designs programs, not just technology programs, but all programs. Uh, I'm getting some interesting headway there. Uh, but I want your help. I, I think it's important uh, for this group to be engaged with the way our government is going, because it can go really wrong. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the, the news about states join, uh, launching a probe of Google Wi-Fi snooping. You know, this is really scary stuff when uh, you know, politicians sort of sent blood in the water and they want to get attention to themselves and they make a big issue out of something that anybody with half a technical brain knows was, uh, you know, sort of maybe not, well, you know, somebody made a mistake, right? And all of a sudden it's this massive privacy brouhaha. And, and I think we have to get engaged. We have to educate people. We have to take our knowledge outside of our walls and make sure that people in Washington don't make decisions uh, that are going to impede our future. Um, last thing I want to just uh, you know, uh, uh, engage you with, I'm, I'm on the board of an organization called Code for America, um, which is trying to build a next generation of civic software for cities. It's a little bit like Teach for America. Uh, we're, we're trying to recruit fellows uh, who go, will spend a year building civic software that will be open source and shareable by cities. Uh, but we're also looking for mentors, people who will help with those fellows, guide them, uh, and, and help them to use the best practices. And, and I just want to uh, point you guys to the Code for America site. I hope that some of you might uh, be willing to volunteer and help us, uh, because I do think that the, the possibility of government doing it right is, um, uh, is, is more present than it's uh, ever been, but also the possibility of government doing it wrong. And just as we've said, uh, one of our goals here in uh, this event is to make you guys into heroes. I think we need a new generation of heroes in government. And I'd love your help in uh, transforming the way that technology uh, can help us build a better society. So with that, I want to thank you very, very much and wish you well. You are an amazing uh, part of the future, and you are building it. Thank you.